welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel. That is the R in the RK Stumbling Bear and I am a reader and a writer. And welcome back for my week 34 wrap up. This has been a really good reading week for me. And so we're just going to jump in with the book wrap up. So to start with, I finished Notorious Sorcerer by Davinia Evans. Finished this actually last weekend, so pretty soon after I had filmed my other wrap-up video. It was just so compelling. I just sat there and read whenever I could. I was reading on my ebook, so that's why he had that motion. This is a new release that is coming out next month in September, and so I will have a more dedicated review coming for it. But this is a fantasy novel. It is rich in its world building, and I would say that the world building has a Middle Eastern Asian kind of influence or feel to it. In the city of Vizim, magic is outlawed. However, there can be alchemists. It just depends on what they're doing. So alchemy kind of walks a fine line of being outlawed or not. And really one of the reasons why it is permitted is because of economics and the upper class. They are the Azada class, but this book is not a heavily class-based society. You, you do have the different classes, but that's not the bone of contention in this story. It's not oppression from the upper classes, though they do get many privileges and you see how things work out for in their favor when shit is going down. There are four points of view in this story. This story is mainly about Sian Velo, who is a member of the Little Bracken Bravi, which Braves are, I think I described them as gangs, but without really the violence. Reading further, the city kind of considers them entertainment, and they can, they can be hired as bodyguards, they can be hired to battle another Brave tribe, as entertainment for people. They they do jobs as well, but it seems like it's more accepted by the, the citizens of Bezim. They don't hate the Brave. The Inquisitors do, but the general population really feel like the Brave are part of their society, and the Brave have people from all classes and their tribes. So it's more of a coming together moment for people. It's considered what a lot of younger people do before they then go off to do their adult jobs or adult careers. So Sian Velo is part of this Brave. His job is to go cross over into other planes, use alchemy, get out chemical ingredients, and sell them for the benefit of the tribe. And his goal at the beginning of this is to become better learned, get more practice, so that one day he can join the Summer Club, which is the organization that recognizes alchemy or alchemists. So that is his goal at this time, is to gain the education that he needs. This story fulfills all the promises it gives you at the very beginning. But it's not the typical Western style of storytelling where you have, here's the issue, everything goes to hell, and now we've solved it. This is where my writer brain comes into it, analyzing things. It Listening to the Writing Excuses podcast, they talk about you have the no and or the yes but, and no means did they tried something, did it work? No, and then this is the consequence or something else happened. Or you have, did they try something, did it work? Yes, but it wasn't exactly what they were thinking would happen and other consequences happen. So the, there's more of those instances in here that you kind of see pull the story along. And when you get to the end of it, you, you're going to realize that the end was mapped out at the very beginning, but it wasn't the focus of what you thought it was going to be. That, that's the best way I can describe it without going really into spoilers, which I don't want to do at this point. This is a new favorite for me. I guess to end this short talking about this book, because I will have a video coming out 
here soon for it since it comes out at the beginning of September. I really love this book. It is one of my favorites of the year. I am very much looking forward to reading the next in the series. It is a series, but even if it wasn't, I would have been completely okay with this book because it tells a complete story. So if you're someone who really likes lush world building, um, intricate characters, this is a book for you. I then finished The Memory Librarian by Janelle Monet and various other authors. And I had buddy read this with Kristen over at Kristen LSFF Reader. And this is a series that is based off of Dirty Computer by Janelle Monet, which is a movie with music videos as the music pieces. It's a dystopia world where there's a group called the New Dawn and they're trying to make everyone the same. And they think the way to do this is to is to take away memories from people, to make them a clean slate. They consider everybody a computer and that they should be able to be programmable. Now my favorite were the two novellas, were consider them novellas because they were pretty long, uh, and that was The Memory Librarian by Janelle Monet and Alea Don Johnson, and then Nevermind by Janelle Monet and Danny Lore, which is the opposite of Kristen. She liked the novelettes that came afterwards more. I like the memory librarian is you're seeing someone who is working for the New Dawn organization because everybody who works for the New Dawn organization, they as well have had their memories wiped upon entering to work for them. Sachette is now to the status that she has been given her memories back. So all the memories that people have either voluntarily given up or have been have had taken from them still exist somewhere, I guess in a database because Sachette has access to them. For me, what I really got from this story is we don't change just because we don't remember. Taking people's memories away is not the way, not the way to solve the problems of society. Ignoring what is the problem does not solve anything. So I really enjoyed that. And then never mind if you watch the video, you'll, there's a sequence where they're at, a ho at the pink hotel in the desert. This is after the movie. So this is, story is actually kind of a continuation of the Jane, what she's doing afterwards as she's dealing with the trauma of having her memories wiped or they were tried, tried to be wiped. And we find out a little bit more about how New Dawn is trying to crack down on those they consider deviant. It also is a great way to show that even when a group of people agree for a certain purpose, there are still factions within that group that are going to conflict and disagree and cause strife with one another. So those were my two favorites. Then after finishing those two items, I was in a like book hangover from Notorious Sorcerer for several days and I realized I needed a reread. So I picked up The Rowan by Anne McCaffrey, which works for my Magical Readathon TBR. This is a book I loved as a teenager and I didn't like it as much and I have thoughts. And because this book came out in 1990, I'm going to have spoilers. So if you haven't read this and are wanting to, skip till you see the next book. But this is a science fiction and I picked it up as a teenager, but I do think this is more of an adult book, new adult to adult. And this follows primarily the Rowan who is called thus because she was in an accident when she was three years old. A mudslide wiped out her village and the reason why she was saved is because she was in a vehicle that protected her and then her mental voice pierced everyone on the planet and they went and found her and really she was a she's telekinetic as well as a telepath and decided that she needed to be trained up and this this is a future where people have talents, that's what they call them, but not everyone does. They didn't go into the scientific explanation of how this happens. What I learned recently is I guess this series is kind of a spinoff of a earlier series. I think what really hooks you into this book is at the beginning you're following the Rowan as she's growing up and you're seeing everything from, a, you're seeing her mostly from adult points of view and when she's a child and you slowly start to get her perspective on things. And where I didn't like this as much is 
this book is very plot heavy and it's going from here to here to here to here to here. While we got moments from Rowan's childhood and her early life that are supposed to say this is her growing as a person to show you who she is, I don't think they were as effective as they could have been. And then this book is split into three parts. And really, I think this book could have been a trilogy in itself. You could have done Rowan's childhood as she grows up to before she gets called as Callista Prime. You could have done a sequence, a book where she is learning to be Callista's Prime and having to develop, make relationships and develop her team. And then you could have ended that with meeting Jeff Raven. And the third book could have been her progression of her relationship with Jeff Raven and then the events that happen on Deneb. Instead we get time jumps and they're not necessarily well done. Also when Rowan and Jeff meet, they meet mind to mind and then immediately they're like, I'm in love with you. Wait, what? I guess as a 16 year old I thought that was totally okay and now as an adult I'm like, ah, uh, no, I want more character interaction before I believe you're really in love. And the language is pretty dated. And when I was reading it, it didn't even feel like it was language from the 90s. It felt like it was language from earlier, like from the 60s or 70s, the way characters were talking with one another, which as a teenager, I was reading a lot of older science fiction from those time periods because that's what my parents have on their shelves. So I'm, I can see why I didn't pick up that the language was different. I, it might seem like I'm kind of ragging on this book because I still like it. I mean, partly that's nostalgia, but it does do some things really well. I can see the seeds of needing to have consent and relationships in this book, whereas we get that more now. But at the same time, there's still the trappings of misogyny because that was a lot of older science fiction where the man just knows best, he has more power, he, all those things. And Rowan pushes back on all of that and a lot of people they either don't like her because they think she's a bitch or they enjoy that she's pushing back and they're like, oh, you're so sweet kind of thing. Very few people actually take her seriously. And I think that's one of the reasons with what happens in Deneb where only the women are sensing the, the oncoming threat is kind of a push to be like, hey, you need to take women seriously. When, especially when they tell you that something's wrong, you should be listening and then you get to see Jeff, who has gotten up to a position of power, take Rowan and his mother seriously. I would call this a foundational book for the path to modern sci-fi that we have now. It, this isn't going to work for everyone, especially if you're a modern sci-fi reader, you're going to come back to this and you're going to be like, whoa, there's lots of issues. And there are, there are a lot of issues. But at the time that it came out, I really think that it was trailblazing. It was setting things up to give people more. Uh, something that might bother people is Anne McCaffrey does not mind age gaps in her romances, in her rela her sexual relations. And she, she does it in the Pern series as well, having people who fall in love with each other and there's an age gap, a significant age gap between them. I think it was handled really well with Rowan's first sexual encounter, especially because she they both are of the legal age and she is cognizant that she's interested in him being her first. It wasn't an issue of grooming. It was her like, okay, I'm an adult and yeah, I met you when I was a teenager, but I didn't, that wasn't our relationship then. And now I'm interested in, you know, something a little bit more, at least for a short period of time. Sorry, probably all over with this, but again, it's going back to something that was a childhood favorite and I didn't like it as much, and it kind of grates on me. But at the same time, I can see how it could have been so much better. And at the same time, I can see how it has influenced what we've gotten and how things are better now. I guess just some thoughts of a childhood favorite. And then I finished my week reading two graphic novels, and they are both, we only find them when they're dead, volume one and volume two. And I was first attracted to these because just the style is gorgeous. 
This is just the, even the beginning. Like the pages the I was like, all right, so this is a science fiction book. It's about human society where they've gone out into the world and they stripped a lot of the resources from asteroids and planets and they're not sure how they're going to survive. And then they find a dead god and they start mining or they call the ships autopsy ships. They start taking parts of the god for food, for energy, for technology. And the central part of this is you only find them when they're dead and when they're dead that's when you then you take things from them and there is a captain who wants to find them when they're alive find out more about them and so that's kind of the purpose of this is looking for them and trying to escape the society who doesn't want you to leave what you're doing so there's a lot of like corporations have become really big and they're squeezing everything they can out of people. And people are trying to fight back. So just some other examples of this artwork that I really love. So I finished this. This is the first one. And then this is the second one. And there's a time jump. And it's dealing with the first one a little bit. Some of the characters are definitely dealing with the ramifications of what they did in the first book. And society has changed and we now have religions that are more fanatical that are worshiping these dead gods or one god in particular and I can't tell you because it really it would spoil the first not first one but again the artwork I am loving in this and I really am hoping that this is not the last one that there's more coming because it's leaves you on a cliffhanger and I want to know what what's gonna happen the central question of the gods has not been answered for me now new release of thon doesn't end until the 31st and I'm not really sure what I want to read I had picked up gallant last week just read a couple chapters this week I picked up Kai K, read a couple chapters I have read the first two chapters in a river enchanted and I've read the first chapter of Removable Echo. I'm not sure what I want to read. I don't know. I mean, read all of them, yes, but to actually make sure that I finish before the end of the month, that is what I don't know. I'm not going into September with any uh, TBR official plans, so I have the time to read these items as I want, but I'm just going to kind of embrace the mood readiness and just see what falls into my lap, basically. For my writing wrap-up, I didn't write this week. I know, I know, it's a, it's a litany. I'm looking very much forward to having time off this upcoming week so then I can reset my clock, my morning routine, and get back into the healthy habits of exercising and writing as I really want to do so that after the vacation, I can then be like, all right, I'm back on track. And then for other media, nothing has really jumped out this week to me and things that I have watched or listened to. I've been just really focused on reading and the book hangover. So I'm just going to go ahead and end it here. I hope that you've been having a good August and let me know what your favorite book has been so far, whether or not it's a new release. I'm curious. Thank you and have a great day.